Arab Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Uh, tonight, guys, we are going very deep. Uh, some important information, things that have been shared with us from uh, for sources that we have uh, in different parts of the world, in fact. We're going to be looking at Syria. We're going to be looking at Iran. We're going to be looking at uh, uh, the Mujahideen. Uh, the terrorist organization that has been trying to overthrow the country. We're going to kind of help really unravel this mystery and even l l correct maybe some of the uh, misunderstandings I had when I was first getting the information out uh, out there to you guys. Uh, who really is involved in the oil tanker strike, in the uh, stopping of the oil supply there in Saudi Arabia. It is Iran. Uh, but the Mujahideen also is playing their own role. And uh, you're going to find out some very interesting connections. And by the way, listen, we're, we're about to go live right there. Not so much live, but on to Hebrew Nation Radio uh, recording the broadcast there. So we're going to record here. I'm going to have to simulcast these things because the information is just that deep, that involved. And uh, I really want to make sure that I can take care of two different things at one time so you're going to be a part of hebrew nation radio but you guys will actually see everything we're talking about those on hebrew nation radio our broadcast called flashpoint will hear what we're talking about and by the way don't forget too we have the program on hebrew nation radio now um waiting for them to get the podcast up and going there but it's called identifying the messiah airs twice a week on the radio broadcast there so you might want to check that out i have been loading up some of those segments there on the noon institute uh as well so i trust you get to listen to that It'd be a blessing for you and i can't wait to share the revelation that god laid on my heart i'm going to try to do that tonight for you guys as well so let's get connected there with hebrew nation radio's flashpoint and we'll listen all together Shalom. Welcome everyone to another edition of Flashpoint. Where is going to be the spark that ignites the world? And it looks like I, it looks like they're over there in the corner striking the matches to find a good match. And they've already got the a bonfire piled high as it could go. With me, of course, a regular guest, insider himself, Stephen Ben Noon. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. It is uh, definitely a lot of matches are being struck right there in the Middle East. Not looking good at all. Uh, you know, I asked you before we started, do you think that we'll even make it through Shabuot, which is J June 16, and you said... No. <laughs> no, I mean, that's only a month away, uh, folks. Uh, so, um, okay, Stephen, I'm going to put myself on mute. Um, we have been trying to get this show off the ground since Friday, actually. Uh, Stephen was at a conference. I just got home right now. I haven't had dinner, um, and I cannot get my main computer to start. No, to start, no, to, to open Skype. So, uh, you know, uh, we're just, uh, you know, if we can't, you know, go through the door, we're going to go through the window. If not, we're going to dig under the fence. Uh, so I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll put myself on mute, Stephen, and you do it. You got it, Bonnie. Listen, this is really a serious situation, friends, and I wished it wasn't so serious. And uh, uh, I have been getting a lot of intel uh, I have my Israeli sources, I have Iranian sources, um, you know, uh, intel here in the United States, but specifically coming from the Middle East, I've been getting some information that's very disturbing. Uh, not only that, uh, Yana brought me just a few moments ago a, 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 a message that Steve Quell had put out on Facebook uh, that wasn't good either. It was a military officer just came out of a briefing, uh, and they're very concerned about the situation in Iran, and we're talking about in the military briefing that the United States does not have air superiority any longer, uh, and how were they going to deal uh, with casualties on the ground there because of not having the air superiority. In other words, no flying, medevacking out by flights as easily because they could be downed and killed that way as well. So um, this situation, Bonnie, is really 
it has exploded uh, in the Middle East there. And I'm going to kind of go back a little bit because the last couple of days we've been doing the live broadcast there uh, just quickly with our phone uh, from the conference up there in uh, uh, and I always get it wrong. I, I don't know if I'm saying, I think it's Cincinnati's way down there on the left side of Ohio. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, we were there doing this conference on Planet X and, uh, you know, and then these things started coming in. I was getting uh, information from one of my good friends who um, uh, used to live in Iran. Uh, and in fact, not too long ago, ended up uh, having to move from Iran uh, and getting some very interesting information even even before we saw the first attack on the uh, oil tankers uh, there in Saudi Arabia actually the United Arab Emirates I believe it was where the oil tankers were uh, that there was the different factions of the uh, uh, Mayahideen that organization uh, that uh, had been caught purchasing or trying to purchase the speed boats in order to uh, weigh those things down with explosives and attack the interest uh, of the U.S. in the, in the, uh, the Gulf there, uh, in that Gulf region there by Iran, uh, the Gulf of... Uh, let me just pull it up on the map for you guys, just for those of you that are watching by video feed, those of you that are listening to us here on Hebrew Nation Radio... Um, I don't want to get any of my words wrong here, but uh, so, well, it'd be good for regardless of who we're looking, talking to right now tonight. But uh, I want to give myself a bird's eye view there. Per, the Persian Gulf is what I'm trying to say, but the Gulf of Oma, uh, Oman is really what I'm thinking about uh, at this point because we know that in that region right there, Iran was talking about blocking that access. Uh, claiming its own territorial waters to stop the oil supply going through. Now, to kind of give you guys, to back up a little bit about what we had been sharing with, uh, with you guys already, I was getting information from an Iranian source that I have that the uh, Mujahideen, which is a, has been known as a terrorist organization, but yet they've worked uh, very closely with President Bush and now even uh, with President Trump's administration. And the, when we say that, that's uh, Ma, uh, Mariam uh, Raja, Rajavi is the woman who is the head of this organization, uh, the Mujahideen organization there, that has the ear and attention of uh, Trump's administration about the overthrow of Iran. And I'm going to be going into that organization specifically. We're going to be talking tonight about who is funding this organization. Uh, or excuse me, not who's funding it, but as far as who that organization is funding. Let me clarify that there. Uh, and But yet at the same time, I was being told that, that members of this organization here had been arrested in both Europe and in Kuwait trying to purchase the, 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 the vessels that they wanted to use to uh, put explosives on and then blame it on the Iranian government and attack uh, U.S. interests there in the Gulf. Now, that's what we saw go on. We saw that uh, there were uh, oil tankers that were struck. Mainstream media reported only two. Uh, now, I, now, this group that is trying to purchase the... Uh, t uh, mines or, or uh, explosive devices. What group was that again? The they, that's not Iranian? Uh, they are an Iranian group. They call them the uh, Mujahideen. But these are the people, Bonnie, that are that have been working um, since, well, we're going back all the way to the 70s. They've been a faction, I think, since 1979 that was created to overthrow the Iranian regime, the current regime under the Ayatollah. And, uh, and they've been involved in all types of wars, including Afghanistan, to try to defeat the Russians. Uh, they've always ran a secret base inside of Iraq. And in fact, uh, they were the very ones that uh, were brought into Iraq, uh, were trained militarily uh, in order to overthrow the Iranian government, uh, but they failed in doing so. Uh, the, the source that I had said that this group here uh, is, they said that, you, I'll put it like this here, he told me, he said that Stevie says, the 
Iranian people don't like the Iranian government. He said, but they actually hate the, the Mujahideen more than they do the Iranian uh, government itself. And, uh, and of course, as we get into the broadcast, Bonnie, we'll find out exactly why, and I can understand why this is. But these guys have been backed by uh, the U.S., and I've actually even got a link where the Mossad has backed them. Uh, and, of course, trying to topple, destabilize uh, Iran and completely overthrow it. They haven't been successful yet, but it's not just been Iran. They've also worked with ISIS uh, in, in, the, uh, in the wars going on in the Middle East right now, whether it be Iraq, uh, Syria, and uh, they have been heavily involved in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, that's going back to the uh, late 70s there to push back when Russia was fighting uh, in Afghanistan. Are the are the Mujahideen uh, kind of like the uh, CIA-banked Iranian ISIS? That's a good way to put it. In fact, uh, parts of their members of their group are ISIS members. They are the, uh, the, the I guess you would call it the caliphate. Uh, they, they are supporters of the ISIS militants. So, so I've, and, and, and granted, I'm just, I'm like in the beginning stages of trying to unravel all this information. Uh, it's so deep and so complex. Uh, and so, and in fact, my own source has had to, he's had to send me information. Uh, and, and it's dangerous to send this type of information, mind you, but he sent me information to try to make sure I really understand and know where to look for the information so I'd better understand the organization itself. Is it possible that this actually is, uh, when I say U.S., I mean, it's not the people, but it's the globalists who have commandeered our government. I mean, you know, the people don't like the government. I mean, wow. <laughs> I mean, the, their name is Legion. The name of that is Legion. Um, it's the globalists who have taken over and, and re, they have seized the wealth of America to uh, achieve their own globalist goals. And they themselves um, are trying to foment this war so they can bring about the final cataclysm that their god, uh, Satan, can then, um, you know, take rule of the earth. Is it possible that they're using U.S. funds and this is actually U.S. backed? Well, you know, this is what's kind of strange about this group here. And uh, let, let me just, I want to read to you part, and I can't show this uh, information on the screen, but I can read to you guys uh, some of the information that's shared with me so we can understand about the group a little bit better. And I've actually got a video up, which I will read the subtitles on this in just a moment. Uh, but in 2003, Ayad Alawi had the ears of the Bush administration. This is the letter that was sent to me. He told them the whole Iraq can't wait for the Americans and what what happened, happened. In other words, uh, Ayad Alawi was the mind that, the, the mastermind that helped overthrow the Iraqi government uh, and of course supplying false intel that the Iraqi government had weapons of mass destruction. Now, oddly enough, though, Bonnie, Mossad was heavily involved in that as well, because we know that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu back then said that uh, they had the evidence that the Iraqi government had the yellow cake. Uh, we sent CIA operatives in there. They made a movie about it, uh, that, uh, in fact, they had the yellow cake, which was never true. It was all fabricated information. We toppled the nation on false pretense. But he goes on to say, Maryam Rajavi has the ears of the Trump administration. Pompeo and uh, Giuliani and Bolton all have been receiving money from Mujahideen according to their tax returns for the speeches they held in a camp Asharaf in Iraq as well as in their there in Paris. Now that really caught me off guard, but. It is true. I've been digging and uh, I have been finding the evidence. And yes, uh, may, former New York Mayor Ru uh, Ru uh, Giuliani is involved with this group, was paid uh, as much as $20,000 speaking fee 
to go to their camp, the Asharaf in Iraq. And this camp is a noted cult, sex cult, perverted camp. And of course, this is also where they trained uh, their fighters to overthrow the Iranian, uh, the Iranian government. Um, and when I was looking at this, one of the things I did, because I was told that if you look up the Asharaf camp in Iraq, uh, I was told in the letter here that, Steve, you'll find there's a lot of information out there. Well, I've got this one video up right here, and uh, I'm just going to read the subtitles. I won't have the volume on, but just so people can get an idea of what's going on. In the picture, uh, for those of you that are, that, that are listening here on Hebrew Nation Radio, if you can see the picture here, uh, Musad, uh, Musad Raj, Raj, Rajavi, he is the leader of the Muhayyadin uh, group at that time. He's standing there at the platform, and he is about to address the fighters after their failed uh, coup of the Iranian regime. And he's going to blame them that when they were fighting, this was including both men and women, that they had their minds on their wives and on their husbands, which, by the way, all their marriages were rearranged and forced marriages. And in this documentary that speaks about this, the women have come out uh, that were able to escape this and have uh, spoken publicly about the humiliation they went through as being a part of this. So here's what he actually says here. He says to them, everyone must know well, um, hang on one second here, I'm going to put a tiny, tiny volume in there, must know well, and your sisters, and you sisters, we asked around hundreds He goes on, am I right, Miriam? Now, by the way, Miriam is his wife. Miriam Rajavi is the very one right now, and she's sitting there on the platform just to his uh, left side. She is his wife. She was actually married to another man, but because of the failed coup, she was taken away from her husband and now was being was marrying this the, the leader himself. All right? So he's, he's getting her to acknowledge this truth. He says, those who were in operation eternal light in person and listened to them. All right, continuing on. Let's remove all the obstacles in the way, he says. This is a lesson of union and unity. It was a very difficult process for me as it was a mental torture for me. Now, this is one of the women that are speaking out about that afterwards. Now, what she's going to say, and I won't play anymore, I'll just, just kind of give you a little so we could see and hear a little bit of his voice there and what he's saying. What he did after this failed event, he blamed the, the failure on the fighters because they were worried about their loved ones back home. Now, anybody's worried about their loved ones in a case of wartime. Americans are uh, as well. So he blamed it on them. So what this cult leader does, this terrorist leader, he takes and forcibly breaks up the families. He tells the mothers, you will hate your children now, breaks up the children, breaks up the marriages, and totally separates them and has them marry in amongst other men in the group there and these mothers have to leave their children and everything behind and so they've done this documentary to point this out now i don't want to spend too much time on that but it's just to kind of show you just how sinister this group is and that very camp that very camp where this was going on what ended up happening there is that this is the camp where john bolton himself has gone and spoke publicly and is paid by this organization. And the information is available on the internet to be able to see that. And even as my source says, you can look at his tax returns and see uh, that they're being paid for the speeches that they held in the camp of Asharaf in, in Iraq. So 
Uh, he says the relationship between them, the, this is the source that I have here, this, the sending this, the Mayadin goes back 20 years. People in Iran don't like their government but hate the Mujahideen because they helped Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. And that's what he says about them. Now I've got s several letters here and we're going to go into more of this because now we're going to go back, Bonnie, and we need to focus on what's really going on and what has actually happened here in the, uh, the, the, the region there of Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, the, the Gulf of o o o Oman, and of course right now we're seeing in the news that the Yemenite Houthis are the ones they're blaming right now for the latest attacks that have taken place uh, in that region there. And of course the latest attack uh, there's actually, there's a third one already now. Let me just bring that up real quick too. There's a third attack that happened earlier that is being, that is in a place called Tabriz, the oil facility. Any, uh, and it says was uh, uh, north, uh, let's see, was due to a cyber attack. If true, then it is response to the Houthis drone attack at Aramco oil pump stations in Saudi Arabia. Now that is supposedly a retaliatory attack against Iran's oil supply. Now, it's really getting strange, Bonnie, because what they're doing is they're attacking each other's oil supply to try to stop them from being able to get the oil out of these countries here, uh, which is going to gravely affect the United States. Uh, but what we had happen was Iran is, is uh, indirectly blamed for the attack on the oil tankers as well as the attack on um, uh, the drone attack on on one of the facilities there. Uh, let me, I got, I'm going to pull this, I'm going to actually pull from the, uh, the source information that I was given on this as well. Let me make sure I get the right letter here before I do that there. Um, okay. So what we're looking at here is uh, now let's see U.S. Okay, U.S.A. airstrike okay attacks. All right. Before I read the letter, let me kind of go into this here. When I first was getting the information that that was shared with me with my Iranian source, all the information I shared thus far was correct. The Mujahideen were the ones that had uh, got caught trying to purchase these boats to use them against U.S. assets in the region. Specifically, they were talking about ramming uh, U.S. military ships there and setting off these explosives to draw the U.S. into a war with Iran. Uh, now, of course, as I mentioned already in our broadcast before, the Mujahideen were backed by the U.S., uh, as we can even see with the Trump administration. But then I was corrected on one issue from the source that I have there in Iran. He said the actual attack on the oil tankers and then the drone attack on the uh, oil pipeline was actually done by the Iranian government itself and not the Mujahideen. That's what caught me off guard. I want to read to you directly what he says to me here in this letter that I just got uh, last night. He says, in 2009, at the height of the tensions between the U.S. and Iran, it came to a point that the U.S. airstrike attack seemed imminent. The leaders of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in their interviews tried to sound confident, but you could feel a sense of resignation and hopelessness in their statements. He goes on, this time around, they're nothing but confident. I believe what played down in Syria, where the U.S. was using the best Arab fighters seasoned from the Afghan war combined with U.S. reconnaissance weaponry, air support, and by the way, this is what really gets me right here, ISIS and al-Nusra. He's actually telling me, even in the letter here, that the United States, when they were fighting with their seasoned tra trained fighters from the Afghan war, 
was using the best of the U.S. had, including the U.S. reconnaissance weaponry, air support, and ISIS fighters and al-Nusra fighters. Now, you know, I've always said, guys, this is something, Bonnie, and I've said it, you know, we've said it on Hebrew, Hebrew Nation Radio as well, that unfortunately, and it's really kind of like no mystery when it, mystery when it comes to maybe al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, uh, we know that, even Israel has openly admitted supporting Al-Qaeda uh, because they said they want to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad. They figure he's the, the big bad boogeyman in the Middle East and they got to overthrow him. But this was the first time that I had intelligence sources sharing with me that the U.S. is using ISIS fighters in this, in this battle. He goes on, though, to say, and the Ira Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, came, uh, came out on top is the reason for their self-belief. All right, now let me kind of clarify this before I read on. What he's saying here in the letter, in 2009, when we nearly come to blows with Iran there, Iran was trying to sound confident, but they weren't. They didn't have any kind of real true backing. They had not really been in any conflict uh, directly or indirectly with the U.S., so they were only sounding tough. Now he's telling me because they have been able to defeat a U.S.-backed uh, military operation, not only the U.S., but you have the Saudis, you have the Turks, uh, all trying to overthrow the Syrian government, that the Ira Iranian Revolutionary Guard has sent in support, manpower, into Syria to stop Bashar al-Assad from being overthrown, and they actually won the war in there. They and, 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 and it's been conceded that they've won. Now, of course, the fight's all starting back up, and he says that this is what gives them the courage to feel like that they can, now, now they can stand up against the U.S. Here's what he goes on to say, though. He says, I believe Iran has just showed a bit of what it can do. The drones penetrated 1,050 kilometers into Saudi Arabia, hit seven spots. They hit the stations. They showed they can close Bab al Madad, and they don't need to close the Strait of Hormuz to do it. That is provocative. He said these two events, the tankers, drones, was not a gasket flag, but Iran's first response to America. Then he wrote on here as well, Pompeo went to Europe to calm them down because they know about the Mahajadeen are trying to start a war to give America the uh, the alibi it needs to, to, to start the war itself. In other words, to give the Americans the excuse to go to war with Iran. And he knew the Mahajadeen were doing this, that they were already trying to incite the violence there. And as a result of what they were doing, which by the way, that's this, this arrest in Kuwait and the arrest in Europe. If I understand right, those two arrests is what caused the U.S. to move assets, their own fleets there, Abraham Lincoln, the USS Abraham Lincoln, to the region. And then, of course, Iran gets bold after the U.S. shows their military might, and he says Iran is the one that hit the tankers and sent the drone in as well, showing that we can shut down you economically with the oil by what we're doing here. Now, I really think, Bonnie, that Iran knows they can't defeat the United States in a war. But they know that America depends on the oil coming from Saudi Arabia, coming from the Middle East, to keep the economic powerhouse moving in America. And they're using this particular tactic here to say, we can cripple you economically. If you want to mess with us, yeah, you'll defeat us, but we can cripple you economically. I think that's where we see this going. Right. Welcome back to the second half, folks. Uh, and we are in the middle of, my goodness, the flashpoint is just about to be uh, a lighted, <laughs> a lit. <laughs> Light it up. Hey, let my English And, you know, it means that our up. salvation is drawing nigh. So, you know, yes. um, you know, I read 
for the last couple of days, two different people who ostensibly re- believe, uh, hear from the Lord. Uh, one is Linda, uh, Glenda, Glenda Lomax. The other is Jeff Byerly, with very detailed, and they and they agree on this. That even though what they post, they I don't, I don't think. I mean, they don't say they talk to each other, but um, Trump has had DNA and uh, enhancement and this was uh, a year ago April when we bombed Syria over the fake uh, Sari gas attack allegedly by Assad on his own people but at that moment at that month and that I think is maybe is why he has changed there's no wall now. He's not interested in defending the independent press. Uh, and he goes uh, after these globalists. He supports these globalist plans of, you know, invading or, or causing big trouble for Venezuela uh, and uh, just allowing the globalists. And now I'm wondering if we don't see that in the Middle East, even with... Um, with what we're seeing there. I, I can believe that, Bonnie. This is alarming. Uh, yes. It's an alarming situation. Yes, and, yes. Uh, especially since Russia, uh, you know, they took the opportunity to display and show everyone their Poseidon uh, drone, underwater drone, that is capable of, it, it will evade all of our defenses because we don't have an underwater defense, and it, it it is capable of producing a 1,500-foot tsunami wherever it's placed. Unreal. So, you know, I, I think that Putin is saying, you know, it, it, and I wonder, when you said that Iran is saying, yeah, yeah, come on, USA, bring it on, give me your best shot, you know, between... The the we can bomb your pipelines. We can we can str- shut the Straits of Hormuz, and I I believe they are arming the Iranians are arming Abu Musa, a small our um a small island, uh, uh it just inside the Gulf, um there. And uh, it's a very narrow turnaround there for big ships uh, in the Strait of Hormuz, and they could just sit there and pick them off all day, uh, even before the ship gets um, uh, uh, straight away, so they could. You, but anyway, right, uh, it you're seems right. like so much happening. I didn't mean to interrupt, so Stephen, you go ahead. I'll mute myself. No, <laughs> you don't have to mute <laughs> yourself, Bonnie. So. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's it's very serious situation going on, and uh, as you mentioned, the Gulf of uh, Hormuz uh, and also the Persian Gulf there, and that little bitty strait right there. Uh, and of course, you guys that can see it via the uh, watching on Israeli News Live, you know, you got that little horseshoe, so to speak, there right by Dubai, uh, Iran, right across the straits there, and and it's not it's not a wide place either. You know, you're talking about a very narrow body of water uh, looks like it's about oh 20 miles wide at the narrowest point which I mean this probably would seem pretty big but it's not that big in terms of uh, if you if you're trying to defend the area uh, anyway as we were saying on the earlier broadcast Bonnie the first half when we were talking about these things we were getting into the fact that the US military is going to be moving more military assets into the region there and that's being reported on a lot of different outlets, ABC News, uh, their website, uh, .com, the latest U.S. ready to ship military assets uh, in the Middle East. And I'm right now hoping that while we're on the broadcast to get an ETA on that movement of troops there. Uh, and, you know, the, in fact, the president actually had talked about sending 150,000 troops into the region. Now, I don't think this is what they're talking about in, the, in moving all the assets here. Let me share with you, though, uh, from a good friend that I have in Israel uh, who sent me some information about this as well. And, and when I, before I even read this information, uh, let me just really encourage uh, all of our listeners 
both here at Israeli News Live, Hebrew Nation Radio here on Flashpoint. If there's ever a time you wanted to pray for, for Israelis, their safety, this is the time and hour. Uh, I don't appreciate myself personally what Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, has been doing, uh, the United States has been doing, NATO has been doing, that is just escalating this entire Middle East situation. But at the same time, I realize too that when we get involved in a war like this, like in the Iraq war, that's American citizens that are putting their lives on the line uh, that will die as a result. Uh, not to mention the innocent civilians that are being killed in these wars. Uh, but it's also in this, this war here, there's going to be a lot of Israeli, Israeli citizens that will die as a result of this. Uh, and so my heart really goes out. And what I'm about to read to you might really come home a little bit more when I, when I share this with you. And this is, the, this is a portion of the letter that was shared with me here. Uh, said important government meetings says that Israel and the USA are very concerned about the economic blowback of war with Iran. All right, now I'm going to pause for a second. And of course, as I read to you on the letter from my Iranian source, it was Iran directly that struck the Saudi, the, the Saudi Arabian targets. And by the way, I want to clarify something because I know that when I covered this originally, I said seven oil tankers had been struck. Uh, and I know that Paul Bagley also had mentioned the same thing. I think he said as many as nine. When it came out in mainstream media, they said two, and everybody said, up oh, it's like fake news. This source here from the region says the drones penetrated 1,050 kilometers into Saudi Arabia and hit seven spots. These two events, and then he says, tankers, drones, was not a gasket flag, but Iran's first response to America. Now, from what I'm reading from my friend in Israel, this is exactly, they got the message because he says here, Israel and the USA are very concerned about economic blowback of war with Iran. Why? They see that Iran is going to target what hurts us most, the oil supply. You remember uh, Saddam Hussein did the same thing. He set all of his oil fields aflame. Well, we, could, we could tolerate that, but our main supplier for the United States has always been Saudi Arabia. Russia is one of the largest oil producers as well, and so is Iran. But if, if, we, if we make them the enemy and they take out the, the economic uh, backbone of America, it's going to bring our economy to a halt. Now watch what else he says. The thought is at this time to prepare for that at a, at a possible economic depression. Buy food, gas, and water, and meds. Now for here in Israel, the public is being told nothing here on this. They want us to die. They want 90% of us to die. They want a, a world cataclysm. And the only question is, who is going to rule the fourth, the final global empire? Well, Who's going to rule? Exactly, Bonnie. But, but isn't that, isn't that, isn't that That's a horrible. Shame? I mean, I mean, this yeah. is an Israeli saying that the public is being told nothing here on this. In other words, when it comes to the Israeli citizens, they're not being told to prepare, buy gas, water, and food, and, and put stuff in your shelters and stuff. They're just going to be left out to die. Yeah. And, right. uh, and I which, know, which you have said, uh, Netanyahu wants that. In yes. his own country, and surely the globalists—I mean, their number one aim is to eradicate the United States, so they can rule the world. They say we can't rule the world while the U.S. is, so they have to defeat us. So if Iran, if they get into a, a, um, you know, I mean, they're 
they're transnationalists, they're globalists, they don't have any uh, nationalist, you know, love for any country that they're in, uh, you know, I mean, certainly not America, certainly not. Hey, you guys are going down. We have our bunkers. We're going to pop up like gophers afterwards. And, uh, you know, hey, we're going to rule the world. That's it, Bonnie. And, you know, I'm going to read one more sentence he says on here. I just out of this very in-depth information. He says, the public is being told nothing here on this. It is thought that when more assets, Abe Lincoln, get in place... That's kind of like using code words, so it's not picked up in the email very well. Uh, when Abe Lincoln gets in place, he said, uh, there will be attacks on Iran and its Navy. So, I guess they're looking at trying to do a crippling blow. How yeah. long before Abraham Lincoln is in place? Well, that's what we're waiting for now. We have another oh, source I see. with that's that the, intel. That's so. the waited for email or yes, text. Yes, <laughs> so yeah, we're waiting right now for a confirmation of when that gets in place. Now, let me kind of take you guys to a few more things here as well. I want to show something to you. Now, we were talking about uh, the uh, Muhayyadin, and this is the part of the uh, Iranian uh, Iranians that are trying to overthrow the Iranian government and from what I was being told they're really the ones that started this uh, now he did kind of seem to clarify that with me my, my Iranian contact seemed to clarify that with me that the uh, Muyahadeen and I, I don't know if I pronounced this name per correctly but I hope I do I think I think that is the right way to pronounce it uh, in the, the specific branch of what they call the MEK of the Muhyiddin, this group here created this situation because they were purchasing the vessels to strike American interest in the region, and so therefore the United States sent in its military power as a result of that. Well, then the U.S. military, just kind of recapping this so people really follow this, the U.S. military then sends in their our ships, the USS Abraham Lincoln, into the region there, and uh, next thing you know, now it's no longer the Muyadin. Now the Iranians decide to show America, if you're going to mess with us, we will strike you where it hurts most. All right, but I want to show you though. This is from an article. I'm going to read a little short portion here from Israel National News. Arut Shiva, very orthodox right-wing paper in Israel, they did an in-depth article about this Muyahideen group, and this is coming back from uh, 2017, in July of 2017. It says here, according to Human Rights Watch, which interviewed several former MEK members, which is the Muyahideen group, the organization is a cult that has kept its members virtually imprisoned and in a compound in Iraq and controlled them psychologically. They eliminated anyone who expressed their intent to leave. A RAND report commissioned by the U.S. DOD found that the MEK is a cult that utilizes mind control and practices mandatory divorce celibacy, authoritarian control, forced labor, sleep deprivation, physical abuse, and confiscation of assets. The FBI reported the MEK, uh, NLA, National Libertary Army fighters are separated from their children who are sent to Europe and brought up an MEK-supported network. These children are then returned to the NLA to be used as fighters upon coming of age. All right, that's just a little bit about what the Israelis say about this group. And yet at the same time, we see people like former Mayor Rudy, uh, Rudy Giuliani in an article here on Politico.com says, took money from a group that killed Americans. Does Trump care? Well, does Trump know? I mean, look, I, I'm not trying to take up for President Trump, but also sometimes I wonder if he even knows what's going on, right? So... Rudy Giuliani's taking money from this very group that even the Israelis consider a terrorist organization, manipulative organization, right? And now here's what's really strange. 
We get this in 2017 that Israel's is writing about it. And, and by the way, the Ruth Shiva is very pro-Netanyahu organization, pro-Orthodox Jewish organization. But now here is a, a, a clip here from Fox News. Um, and, and with Fox News, Miriam, uh, Rod, uh, let me pull her name up so I don't mis, mispronounce it, Rajavi, she's the one that has the Trump administration's ear now. And in that interview right there, Miriam Rajavi is going on there talking about that the Trump administration, they got to take down Iran. That's an interview with Fox News. I'll just give you the date on it, October 13th, 2017. Right about the time that Israel's writing about how horrible this group is, and even all the way up until recently in news on Fox, etc., this woman is brought out as if she's some kind of great saint or something. All right? And I'll just, let me, you know, so... Well, I won't play it for right now, but you know, so you can just see her picture there. Those of you watching on Israeli News Live there, so you know what we're talking about here. Uh, and yet Israel considers them a terrorist group. All right, now, let me move on to another issue here. Here you go, John Bolton, right here. You can see in the picture here, uh, this is on one of the Twitter images that I pulled up. She's right there meeting uh, John Bolton and, of course, other uh, senators, congressmen there. In fact, I, the one congressman, I forget his name, but I know he was on Israeli News Live that's standing on the stage there. Uh, but this lady here, John, or excuse me, John Bolton, also had been paid, I think, like $20,000 a pop speaking at their very camp where they do all these deeds that the Israeli newspaper Arut Shiva spoke about, where they do the mind control, manipulation, forced divorces. John Bolton was speaking at their very compound in Iraq and getting paid for it. I wonder why these guys sing their praises. Now, but this is something, though, that I found that was very interesting. Because you have Arut Shiva saying how evil this group is, but I want to show you a connection that the New Yorker brought out. And Bonnie, this, this will get your, really, to thinking. This article here in the New Yorker, uh, let me just real quick, we'll pull up the date on this so people know the date. This was on April 5th, 2012. All right? Read a little section of this only. Said a terrorist organization by the State Department in 2002, the MEK, which is the Muhayyadeen Terrorist Organization, earned some international credit, credibility by publicly revealing accurately that Iran had begun enriching uranium at a secret underground location. Mohammed al Baradi, who at the time was the director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Nuclear Monitoring Agency, told me later that he had been informed that the information was supplied by the Mossad. So he goes on and says the MEK is... There you have it. Yeah, the MEK is... There you have it. Right, with Western intelligence deepened after the fall of the Iraqi regime in 2003. So now we know who's working with these guys. Yep. Now... now it's Sometimes I think, you know, the, the voters are just the audience. I mean, they're, they're the audience and we're just watching a play. And here comes the, you know, the Russian character. Here comes the USA character. You know, it's, it's all just, I mean, it might, might, might have been, you know, a, a, an opera written by Mozart if it weren't so. <laughs> I mean. Right. That's right, Bonnie. And, but, you know, here's. Real a... and happening in front of us. Here's one nice thing I could say about this, though, and this is what I guess we really have got to look at as well. Uh, if you go back to the article here on Arut Shiva and how they really expose this organization, and this is what I always say. This is under an article entitled U.S. Betrayal at the Highest Level. All right? Because according to the Israeli article on Arut Shiva written by uh, Emil Imani, on July 7th, 2017, about this organization, this shows you that there are genuine, true Israelis that want to know the truth and will, and will publish the truth. But undoubtedly, Mr. Omani had no idea that the Mossad was involved in helping this organization, only saw that the United States was in behind this organization. Uh, he even puts on here, the, the, the invitees in this article on, on, that Arut Shiva wrote, 
uh, writing more about it, says, A few years ago, several high-ranking American and European officials and dignitaries attended the NCRI, the National Council of Resistance in Iran, rally held in Paris. The invitees included M.G. Paul uh, Valley, U.S. Army retired, former ambassador of the uh, United Nations, John Bolton, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, former Speaker of House Newt Gingrich, and several others. The participants gathered in a conference room supposedly to support Iranian opposition groups. That the, and, he, and he mentions it right here. The NCIR is not representative of an opposition group. In fact, the NCIR is an offshoot of the MEK, the Muhayyadin Khalik is the actual name for that MEK organization, a devout Islamist Marxist entity known for their ISIS-style terrorism. Now, that just gives you another link, Bonnie, right there. These guys are linked to ISIS. And my very, what did I read to you earlier, guys, when I read to you the intelligence source that I have from the Iranian uh, so source that he speaks about this group and he says U.S. reconnaissance weaponry, weaponry and he's talking about how that they got emboldened because they were defeating the U.S. Who And he says in here that the U.S. was using ISIS and al-Nusra. And even right here in the very article where the root Shiva says the group there is an ISIS style. Now they says style terrorism. So they're not identifying them exactly as ISIS, but according to the Iranian source that I do have, which by the way, again, I will say this, my Iranian source does not care for the, uh, the, the regime of Iran. All right. But as he said, Iranians dislike this group even more. And in fact, their members hate their, their own group because of what they've done to these people. Uh, kill them if they try to leave, torture them, all kinds of evils. But we're seeing more and more now proofs and links of cooperation with the ISIS militants, uh, terrorist organization. But as I, I say again, though, Bonnie, and I just want to make sure I stress this, this shows there's some really good Israelis, which we know that anyway. I mean, God, ha he's, got, he's got Just a like remnant. This country. Yes, he's got a remnant in Israel. And I don't know yes. how much time we have left, Bonnie, but I, I've got a, a, some amazing stuff about, still yet. About six minutes. Okay, let's hit Syria now. More okay. intel coming out of Syria. Um, we have another issue coming up. <laughs> said almost salaciously. <laughs> yes. But uh, I'm, I'm interrupting. Sorry. No, you're quite all right. Uh, this is exciting here. Uh, yes, I've got some very interesting information coming up about Syria. And I think the article here on the Jerusalem Post really kind of helps capsulate what I'm going to talk about. This article came out uh, today, I believe it was. Well, yeah, it came out today. Uh, it is, the title of the article is, uh, whoop, Syrian Opposition Leader Urges Normalization with Israel. Fahad al-Masari is his name. Uh, he has been living in France for the last 24 years. And uh, he is talking about having normal relationships with Israel. So, as I have been told thus far, and it's not to say, but they, the source I do have on this believes that this could be another one Guaido type scenario. Now, that's an opinion, uh, but I can see why he is saying this to me, uh, because this is exactly what Israel and the United States would like to see happen. They want, and I have been told, they're going to take down. Damascus. It is coming. And with the situation happening right now with Iran, I can see why Damascus will be hit. And so one thing I wanted to share, though, Bonnie, though, that is such an amazing thing uh, about this. I don't have to go so much into the war aspects of this. We know what is, can happen. Damascus, Scripture says, will be a ruinous heap. And... Um, I literally got a revelation on that very passage while I was sitting in an interview with, with uh, Pastor Paul Begley on his program that he has on, uh, let's say, broadcasting. I think it's TV. I forget the channel that's on, but it's going to be airing here in the near future. 
right in the middle of the broadcast, and I even said it, as I'm getting the revelation, even now as I'm speaking, I was reading from the scripture of Isaiah 17, the, uh, the uh, Damascus becomes a ruinous heap, and uh, let me just, I'll pull that up so we can read that, uh, so everyone can, we can make sure we get this just right when we speak about this there. But, uh, and, and so many of us know, we know the prophecy. I've spoken about this many times here on Hebrew Nation Radio as well, and uh, how that God holds accountable Israel, but not, as I always bring out, it's not specifically the state of Israel, because when we get, when we see here, we see that the burden of Damascus, to behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. When you get down to verse 10, though, we find out that God says there, for thou, for you have forgotten the God of your salvation, and you are not mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, is the rock to the Christians. And he specifically mentions Israel in here, the children of Israel, forsaken from before the children of Israel, which represents 12 tribes, not just three. So it's not just the house of Israel or the house of Judah that is now home in the promised land, but the remnants of the children of Israel that are all over the face of the earth, whether it's NATO, whether it's the United States. But I think, Bonnie, it's not only that, it even includes Russia, because there are members of the lost tribes of Israel in Russia as well. So collectively, because of all the wars that are going on here in the Middle East, this brings about the demise of Damascus. This is what takes away the stronghold of, of, of it, it says it says here uh, verse 3 for the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus which Damascus had become a fortress to Ephraim which are the original believing house of Israel that accepted the words of Yeshua 2,000 years ago and where one of the largest or the oldest I should say the oldest Christians on the planet are from Damascus. In other words, they have been there for the last 2,000 years. Now, here's the revelation I got. I'm sitting there talking about this, and it came to me. Suddenly, Saul, when he was not Paul yet, he was on his road to Damascus to do what? To bring in bondage to, to back to Jerusalem all those believers living in Damascus. And the Holy Spirit revealed to me, had it not been that Christ stopped him, this passage would never be fulfilled in the future. If he had a wiped out the believers in Damascus at that time there, we would have no believers today where the fortress of Ephraim would cease. So Syria had to be a fortress to those believers all the way up into the modern days here. And this is where it will come to an end and they will end up like the children of Israel and they would be as part of the diaspora, which we've already seen that the Syrians are just like Israel when they went into exile. They've also, many of them are in exile, but it's not over yet. And it's fixing to get worse. It's fixing to get much worse, guys. So we really need to pray for Christians in the Middle East. Uh, pray yes. for our brothers and sisters in Israel as well, uh, because a war is coming, and a lot more innocent people are going to die. And I'm afraid, Bonnie, it is at the door. And you mentioned... Uh, you know, we have the, the feast coming up. Shavuot. Shavuot. And, uh... Pentecost for yeah, everybody it, else. <laughs> yes, it, it, could be, it could be before then. It might be after then. From what we're looking at, Bonnie, it's just a matter of when those assets are in place. And even then, we don't know if it'll happen right then and there. That's always the way we do. We never do it right then and there. But uh, how long will it be? I don't know. Yeah. How long, how long can the world hang on and, and have the globalists uh, uh, trying to vie for the best spot with the most resources and the most pipelines and the most power and the best army? and uh, Goodness, welcome to Satan's kingdom, everyone. <laughs> As if everyone didn't know already um, who sends their kids to public school or has a son in the military didn't know what it was like already. Alrighty, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Yes. Uh, you know, increase your Bible study time, increase your prayer time. Uh, Stephen is right. Uh, it's about 
to explode and the best preparedness is spiritual preparedness thank, thank you, you so much Stephen that was you. that was a lot of energy thank you so much and would you text me when you get your email I will definitely do it I will do thank it thank you so. thank you brother shalom shalom everyone shalom